happy to have you with us today. My name is Vesdana, and I would like to welcome you in front of the whole Jobberty team. For those who maybe don't know who we are, we are a developers community with more than 70,000 users and a place where you can explore ID companies, ID jobs, and read experiences from your colleagues from the industry. We are currently present in six markets, Serbia, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, Macedonia, and Slovenia. And we strongly believe that sharing is caring. And that is why we have started this series of free webinars with industry experts. This is our eighth webinar. And today we are going to be talking about modular monoliths. We are happy to welcome Milan. Milan, welcome. And thank you for being here. Milan is, uh, sorry. <laughs> Milan is a software architect and tech YouTuber, and he will be sharing with us uh, some tips and tricks on how to build a modular monolith and lessons that he has learned along the way. And one more thing, we're going to be having uh, a QA section, session on the end of the webinar, so please feel free to ask any questions that you maybe have for Milan or for us in the QA section. I don't want to be wasting our precious time any longer. So Milan, the floor is all yours. Thank you for the delightful introduction. And uh, thank you to Jobberty for extending this invitation to me. Uh, it's an honor to be talking to you today. Uh, my name is Milan. Uh, I'm a software architect by day and content creator in my spare time. Although you could argue that creating content is my primary occupation, given how much uh, I share daily on the various social medias that I'm present on. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and on my website where I write a weekly blog. You can see all the links on the screen. And without further ado, I'm going to jump into what you all came here for today which is modular monoliths. I'm going to talk about my experience using this architecture on a real project for the past two years. I'm going to explain as best as I can how you can build a modular monolith and what are some of the lessons that we learned along the way. Unfortunately, we had to learn those lessons the hard way, but I'm hoping that in sharing my experience today, you're going to be able to learn those lessons right away and you won't make the same mistakes that we did. So what is our agenda for today? We're going to briefly talk about the monolith architecture. Then we're going to jump into microservices just on a high level. I'm also going to do a comparison between monoliths and microservices. And then we're going to do a deep dive into modular monoliths. I'm going to explain what this architecture is, how you can build one, what are the challenges of actually building a proper modular monolith, and what are some of the lessons that I learned along the way. So here you can see the monolith. What we mean when we say monolith architecture is we have just one application representing the system. Typically, it's going to be one solution if you are working in a .NET environment, so that one solution with one executable represents the monolith. And these days, it's considered kind of old fashioned. Everybody wants to be working in some other kind of architecture because it looks cool on CVs, among other things. But I think there is a lot of beauty in creating a good solid monolith which is why I'm trying to talk about modular monoliths, which are, in my opinion, a good way to build monoliths. And one of the issues with monoliths and why people moved away from them is limited scalability. And what I mean by this is you only have one application, one system. And if you want to scale something, you only can scale that system. I'm going to talk about this more in just a moment. On the other end of the spectrum, we have microservices. So here's our representation of a very complicated system where each node on the screen is one microservice. 
And I'm sure there are actually real world systems that look a lot like this. And if you're working in a system like this, I am sure you're having a lot of fun. So when we say microservices, we mean that many individual services, each doing their own job, form the whole larger system. These days it's considered cutting edge and cool. Everybody wants to be working with microservices because they are very popular, mainly because it's challenging to work with them, but it's also fun and exciting. And one strong advantage of microservices is that at least in theory, they are infinitely scalable because whenever you want to scale something, you can scale that service either vertically or horizontally. Or if you have a bottleneck, you can extract it into a separate service and then scale that independently. So let's try to compare monoliths and microservices on a few points. The first is in terms of deployment. For monoliths, we have one deployment artifact, whereas for microservices, we have many, or rather for each service that is part of our microservice system, we have a deployment artifact. And for microservices, you're going to find that deployment is generally a lot more complicated and a lot, a lot more things can go wrong than with monoliths. When it comes to communication, in a monolith, typically components talk to each other by simple method calls. Given the nature of the system is everything is one, everything is in one physical application. And with microservices, it's a little bit different because each of your service is an independent application running in its own server. So your services, in, if they want to talk to each other, they have to resort to using network calls, typically, using HTTP, but there are other approaches like messaging, for example. Now, when it comes to scalability, monoliths are usually vertically scalable very easily. You can always beef up that server where your monolith is running, make it a bigger machine. And um, you can horizontally scale a monolith, but the downside is you're scaling the entire application and not necessarily the bottleneck that is probably causing you trouble where with microservices, you have the freedom to scale both horizontally and vertically, and even extract services from your existing services if you need to scale some part of your system further. When it comes to databases, in a monolith system, you will typically only have one database, which is very easy to work with. And with microservices, you have usually one database per service, but your entire system is comprised of many individual databases, which adds another layer of complexity. Transactions are available almost out of the box with monoliths because you are usually working with just one database. So you are transactional by the nature of the system. And with microservices, it becomes very interesting because if you want to enforce consistency among services, you have to resort to using distributed transactions, which they slow performance and they introduce a lot of complexity the more services you're trying to keep consistent, which is why people typically tend to trade off consistency and embrace eventual consistency where you commit a transaction inside of a single service, which is transactional or consistent, and then you somehow notify the other services in your system of the change that happened. And eventually your system converges to a consistent state. And when it comes to scaling teams, again, we have kind of opposing points. With a monolith, it, is, it becomes difficult to scale with a large team because everybody is working in the same code base there are a lot of conflicts, a lot of teams making changes to potentially the same parts of code, and it's kind of messy to work with. With microservices, you can make sure the service is large enough to fill the needs of your team and not 
small enough so that nobody has enough work to do. So it's very easy to scale microservices with large teams where each team can be responsible for one or more services depending on how big your services are. So I have a quote here from a guy named Martin Fowler. You might have heard of him. He's actually very influential in our industry. And he said, you shouldn't start a new project with microservices, even if you're sure your application will be big enough to make it worthwhile. Now, I'm going to give you a moment to ponder on this quote and try to think of what he, what, what he actually tried to tell us when he said this. So in my eyes, the reason you shouldn't be starting a project with microservices is because you are going to have a tendency to create, to make your system very granular. You're going to want to make microservice for this and microservice for that. And before you know it, you have dozens of microservices. Whereas if you started with a monolith application and then work with that for as long as you could have, and the benefit of that is you're going to naturally see where the bottlenecks are in your system. And when bottlenecks start appearing in your system, that's a very good sign that that part of your system can be scaled out into a separate service. So it's kind of a more natural evolution towards microservices. But again, if you build a monolith the traditional way, moving into microservices becomes a little bit difficult. So what if we could have the best of both worlds? If we could get the physical architecture of a monolith where everything is still inside of one system and one physical application, one deployment artifact. And on the other hand, we have a logical architecture of microservices where individual features of the system are kind of naturally grouped together as they would be inside of a microservice. And an added benefit is to have the ability to move to a microservice architecture easily. So we can achieve this and it is called a modular monolith. So I'm going to try to explain now what a modular monolith is. And I'm going to start by sharing a few definitions of the modular monolith with you. So the first definition says, a modular monolith is a software design approach in which a monolith is designed with an emphasis on interchangeable and potentially reusable modules. So this is kind of a long definition, but the, the highlight is interchangeable and reusable modules. Okay, let's see another definition. So a modular monolith is an explicit name for a monolith system designed in a modular way. So we can see that kind of everything revolves around the word, around the word modular. And the definition of the word modular is consisting of separate parts that when combined form a complete whole. I'm not going to read the rest of the definition. But the main point here is you have distinct parts in your system that are kind of independent on their own, but together when they comprise, when they come together, they form a complete system. In our world, this is going to be an application. So everything is easier to visualize with a diagram. So I prepared a monolith diagram here of a sample e-shop application or e-commerce application, if you will. And I did actually work on a similar system for the previous two years. So I'm using that as an inspiration. So if it were a monolith, a typical monolith architecture, you would have one application. For example, it can be on ASP.NET Core Web API. And all of the components in our system are going to be C Sharp class libraries, for example. And we have just one database in the system. Now, if we were to convert this system into microservices, 
we could end up with something like this. So here you can see four separate microservices. We have the catalog service, which is responsible for telling us what products are available in our system to be bought. Then we have the order service, which is responsible for creating, managing orders, shipping them, getting, um, taking care of payments and so on. We have the customer service, which takes care of the users in the system, which are rather the customers. And then the collaboration service, which exists so that customers can interact with sales representatives to create an order because in this system, creating an order is very complicated. It's kind of a custom-made e-commerce application. So you can see kind of the contrast with these two systems. On the one hand, everything is monolithic together. On the other hand, everything is kind of nicely organized into individual services where each of them provides its own functionalities. So if we were to try to combine uh, these two diagrams into one, where we want to achieve the physical architecture of a monolith so that we have one system, and yet we want to keep this logical separation that we have with microservices, we would end up with something like this. So this is how a modular monolith would look like. Each of your services would now become a module inside of your modular monolith. But at the end of the day, this is still just one monolithic application. It's one physical application. And all of your components or modules inside of the system are interacting with the same database. Now, I want to highlight here that there are explicit boundaries around the modules. And the arrows here are actually all pointing to the database. They don't represent interaction between modules, although I will talk about that in a moment. So let's talk about what are the challenges of building a modular monolith. And as I walk you through the challenges, it's going to become a lot clearer how you actually should build a modular monolith. So the first challenge is actually identifying and defining your modules and bounded contexts. The second challenge is solving communication between modules. You'll see that there are multiple approaches to, to solve this. And the third challenge is solving module in data independence and isolation. I'll talk about this in depth in the last part. So let's start with defining modules and bounded contexts. So what modules actually are supposed to represent are cohesive sets of functionalities, where cohesive means something that naturally fits together. So if you re recall from our previous example, we had a couple modules. For example, probably something that you can easily relate to is orders. So everything around the orders for functionality will naturally flow together into a cohesive set of functionalities. We also call this a module. On the other hand, we have a catalog module, which covers everything related to representing line items and other things that are available inside of the eShop application. So one definition of what the module can be is the term bounded context, which comes from the book, Domain Driven Design, which was written by Eric Evans. I recommend everyone should read this book, even though, even if you may not like the ideas represented in the book and you don't want to use them in your code, that's perfectly fine. But I think you're going to be a better engineer after reading this book because some, of I some ideas uh, presented in the book are very, very good. One of those ideas is a bounded context. And what a bounded context means is it represents a boundary within a domain where a par particular domain model applies. So again, I'm coming back to the definition of modules where 
I highlighted that they kind of represent a boundary around a set of functionalities, which also aligns with bounded contexts. And an interesting thing with bounded contexts is that a single entity, or you can envision it as a table in the database, can belong to more than one bounded context. An example of that can be a user. A user represents different things in the bounded context of an order and different thing in the bounded context of a payment and different thing in the bounded context of a shipment, for example, but it's still the same physical entity. So one way also to envision modules is that each module can be treated as a separate application. This also has implications in how you define a module in your actual code, which I'm going to talk about now. And I want to discuss how do you actually architect an individual module once you have figured out what are these features that you believe belong to this module, what do you do next? So I said that you can envision a module as a separate application, which means that you need to apply some sort of architecture to your module. And you're going to have many modules potentially inside of your modular monolith. One example architecture that you can apply is the layered architecture, which is very standard. You have just three layers, one for your user interface, which in our case is probably going to be an API. Then you have one layer for your business logic and one more layer for the database. Another option for how you can architect a module is using the clean architecture. You, if you're following me on social media, you probably know that I'm a big fan of the clean architecture. This is because I've used it extensively on many projects and I have found it to be very good for solving many problems. With the clean architecture, you can represent your layers of, of your domain. And it, when comprised together, all of the layers represent one module and you can have more than one individual modules. And lastly, one architecture that has been gaining a lot of popularity recently is the vertical slice architecture, where you have a vertical slice spanning all of the, for example, here layers of the layered architecture, but kind of all of them are physically placed together so that it's easier to navigate individual features. So it doesn't matter really which architecture you choose for your modules. You even have the freedom to choose different architectures for different modules. But what I want you to take out of this is that one module should be architected like an individual application, even though it's part of your monolith. If you want to see a good example of what a modular monolith looks like, here's a link to a repository on GitHub, which contains an example of a modular monolith with domain-driven design. I personally use this repository during my research of modular monoliths. And I found it very, very nice to, to kind of see what the, the concept is and then try to kind of expand it with my own ideas. Thank you very much for, for sharing the link in the chat. Um, so moving on, let's talk about communication between modules. So every module is going to expose some sort of public API that other modules can call. This public API can be maybe an interface that other modules can call to interact with that module that is exposing the public API, or it can be something else. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Now, it's important that there are no references allowed to other modules in the system, except the public API. So if we have two modules, let's for example, say that they are architected 
using the vertical slice architecture, they are only allowed to call the public APIs that they expose. And they cannot reference anything else inside of other modules. Now, this how you achieve this is you hide implementation details of your module, modules internally. In C Sharp, you can achieve this using the internal keyword, which helps you hide the given class that is decorated with this keyword inside of that project. So this is how you can achieve kind of implementation hiding between modules and only expose a public API that other modules can call. Now, when it comes to actually implementing this, you have two approaches. One approach is using method calls. So let's say the catalog module is exposing a public API and the order module is interested in calling that API. This is going to be an interface for the catalog module and also the implementation is going to reside there. But the order module will be allowed to reference this interface and at runtime it's going to be provided the actual implementation. So the benefit of this approach is it's really fast because you're relying on in-memory calls, which are both reliable and performant. You can only call the public API of other modules. And the problem is, and potential pain point, that this introduces runtime coupling. So you are calling the public interface of another module, but at runtime, an interface can be instantiated. So if you are using the interface, something has to implement that interface and actually run that code. So you're introducing coupling at runtime, which may not be apparent, but it's something to you have to consider. And that is because if you ever wanted to extract individual modules into separate services, so now you're moving from a modular monolith into a microservice system, and you were using method calls, your implementation would break because now your other module, for example, let's say the catalog module here, if it were a separate application, then those are different memories and you can't execute memory calls. So you would have to re-implement that public interface, probably using HTTP calls over the network to be able to talk to other modules. So now you switched runtime coupling for strong coupling over HTTP. So because of this, there's a, a different approach, which I'm very, I'm more a fan of than the previous one. And this is module communication using messaging. So the benefit of this approach is that it is asynchronous. If modules want to interact with each other, they send messages over a message bus. It is also possible to implement RPC-like calls over a message bus. So if you are familiar with a library that is called Mass Transit, it implements this send a request response a communication model where let's say uh, the order module wants to request something from the catalog module, it would send a message to the queue. The catalog module would receive this message, handle it, and then send a message back, which would go back to the order module. Now, of course, this abstracts away some important implementation details, like which queues are being used. And also you need some sort of correlation ID between messages so that you know what message you are waiting back. But if you don't want to deal with these complexities, the mass transit library implements this very nicely. So how you interact between modules using messaging is you define contracts or interfaces for your messages. And you can share these contracts using maybe a NuGet package or a shared library where either all your contracts for a single module reside or you can even share all of the contracts for the entire application and kind of manage them all in one place. So the benefit of communication like this is that it is decoupled. If you do a thought experiment, let's say we want to, again, pull out the catalog module into a separate service. 
if we were using a message bus and everything was going over the bus by sending messages, everything will still function the same because we are not relying on in-memory call to implement communication. We are using an external system which still exists even if we were to go from a modular monolith into microservices. So this is one very big advantage of this approach. Of course, the downside is that you do get reduced performance if you rely on too much messaging. So you, you kind of, you're making a trade-off. If you expect that your modular monolith is realistically going to move into microservices, maybe you're better off using this approach from the start of your project. And again, the benefit is it's easy to extract modules into separate services. So this is kind of the, the high level of how you communicate between your modules. You can either use memory in-memory in method calls or you can use messaging over a message bus. For example, we used a RabbitMQ. Now, another important thing that you need to consider apart from messaging is the independence of data between modules. So every module is responsible for its own data. So this is a constraint that you have to impose on the system because if you break this and you allow sharing of data between your modules, then you're going to end up with a mess. So another rule that you have to enforce in your application is that querying data directly from different modules in the system is not allowed, which comes hand in hand with the, the fact that every module needs to be responsible for its own data. And to achieve this, you have different levels of data isolation that you can resort to. And I'm going to talk about these data isolation levels right now. But again, I want to stress and highlight this again. Every module in your system has to be responsible for its own data. And there is no querying of data from other modules. So you can't directly access the database of other modules. So let's talk about how we can isolate data between modules. So there are four levels. And the first level is no isolation. So everything is in one physical database and there is no isolation between modules. And this is the worst approach possible and definitely the one that you should not even consider. So here the problem is you are probably using foreign keys between tables and different modules, which introduces coupling. So if you tried to extract these tables, you would run into a problem because your foreign keys would now break and so on. So one level up in terms of isolation is still using the same database, but using a different schema per module. So now you're, okay, you're still in the same database, but you're achieving at least logical separation of tables inside of the database. So in the example here, each of the modules from our example architecture has, has its own schema. And another thing that you want to impose here is to not use foreign keys, even though you can, because this is going to make it easier for you to migrate into more constrictive levels of data isolation. And again, each module can only query the tables from its own schema. So no querying between schemas. That's very important to have a proper modular monolith. Now, the next level of isolation, if separate schemas are not enough, is using different physical databases. So let's say we're still using SQL, but each of our modules has its own database. Now this can all be on the same database server, but at least it's a separate physically isolated database. So you can't really easily query between the databases without introducing a distributed transaction and you don't wanna go there. So 
this is probably something that you may want to consider, either this approach or this approach, if you were to start out. And then there is one more level, which is kind of exotic, but if you need this kind of isolation, it's very interesting. And that is, now you have different databases for each module, but you're also using different database type for ex or database management system. So let's say for the orders module, we want that relational guarantees and joins. So we opted for a SQL database. Now for the catalog module where we are dealing with products and product information and a lot of unstructured data, we want to use maybe a document database. For the customers module, where we have a lot of relationships between customers, we opted for a graph database and for collaboration for some reason, just to make this slide look better probably, we used a column store database. So you can even do something like this, where you have both physically separate databases between modules and also an entirely different database type, which fits the needs of that module. So you have a lot of freedom when it comes to how much isolation you want to impose on your database. A good start again is probably using either the same database and a different schema per module or using different databases, but still using the same database type. For example, all of your databases are PostgreSQL. And this more or less wraps up the story of how you can build a modular monolith. And I want to share with you a few lessons, a few hardships that we encountered in the previous two years while working on this architecture so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that, that we did. So the first lesson or learning that I would like to share is you should spend more time defining module boundaries. And I promise it's going to pay dividends later. This is because when you're first starting out, you, it really isn't apparent how your system is going to evolve. So if you spend a considerable amount of time at the beginning of the project, just thinking how your system is going to grow, what are the parts of the system that kind of we may want to make independent in the future, you're going to end up with a lot better defined modules. And this is going to allow you to both develop your system faster and kind of later scale it out in a much more performant way. So the next thing is about eventual consistency. And eventual consistency is great. You can achieve it in a modular system, in a modular monolith system. You should definitely use it, but you need to plan for it. So one issue that we ran into was we designed all of our modules to be independent and they were communicating by using uh, messages over a service bus. And we kind of, implemented the entire system to be eventually consistent. And we ran into an issue where kind of the eventual consistency came back to bite us. So you have to consider how eventual consistency is going to reflect on your user experience and maybe where you don't have the luxury of using eventual consistency because some changes in your data may be slow to reflect on the user interface. And this is going to be lead to bad user experience. Now there are ways to, to go around this. For example, your user interface can do eager updates, kind of uh, behave like the update is already applied in the database and wait for the server to respond to kind of confirm, yes, this went through or no, it didn't. Uh, another thing is you can have maybe some sort of WebSockets connection between your backend and your frontend, where as soon as the system converges into an eventually consistent state, 
you notify your application, your front-end application, or other times you're going to have to resort to some way to manage consistency so that it's not eventual, either using distributed transactions, which is something you don't want to do because it's very complicated and slow. Also, maybe something like a two-phase commit, which is again, leaning into distributed transactions. Or you may come to the natural conclusion that, okay, we need consistency here. We can't rely on eventual consistency. So maybe these modules should be merged together. And this is also something that we kind of learned along the way. And it comes kind of as a conclusion of my first point here that you should spend more time defining your modules. What we did was we made possibly too many modules and some of them ended up being chatty. What, what I mean by this is you're going to see that some parts in your system from different modules are going to be communicating with each other very frequently. We can say that they are chatty. So this should lead you to either two conclusions. One is that your module boundaries are messed up. So you put some things of your system into separated modules and they shouldn't be, they should be together. Or your modules are too granular. So you should merge them maybe into one big module and this is going to solve the chattiness. And one last point that I want to highlight is that you need to carefully plan how you're going to share data between your modules. So, and this goes hand in hand with chattiness because chattiness is uh, occurs because you're probably missing data from one module in the other. So they have to constantly talk to each other. So how do you share data between modules? Probably the most decoupled solution to this, and the one I think you should consider is you want your modules to be publishing messages whenever some important change occurs. And then the other modules can subscribe to that and possibly store that data into a local copy so that when they need this data, they no need to go to the other module to get it at runtime. So that's one approach. The other approach would be maybe using some sort of caching mechanism. So, okay, if I have to go to the other module to get some piece of information, I'll pay the cost of a network round trip once, and I'm going to cache that data locally so that I can reuse it for some given period of time while that cache is valid. So this kind of wraps up the main pain points that we had in building a modular monolith. And I hope that this was informative. So with this, I'm going to move into the Q&A section. I see that the Q&A box is lighting up. So you guys have been busy. Just a reminder yeah. again, sorry, huh? almost done. <laughs> so just a reminder for everyone, if you want to talk to me, I'm very active on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and on my blog. So I would love if you were to send me a message, say hi, let me know if you like this presentation and maybe even what I can do better in the future. So with that, let's move to the Q&A. So yeah, we can move to the Q&A section and thank you so much, Milan. It was really useful and we, got a really lot of information. Hopefully everyone enjoyed as well as I did. So let's go to the Q&A. So uh, the first one is, please address modular monolith outside web apps. Okay. So outside of web applications. So I'm not sure what else you are building. Maybe a desktop application or a console application. I don't see those types of systems or let's say a console application mainly 
growing to a big enough size that it requires a modular monolith. But for a desktop application, where I'm talking maybe something like Windows Forms, then most likely you are going to naturally have screens of your system that kind of fit together, which you can consider as separate modules. So you may want to maybe design them like that. But again, another potential issue would be that a lot of the data would be maybe shared between these individual screens. So maybe I would opt for something simpler, but you can definitely use the same approach as with web applications. Okay, we can go on to the another one, right? Yes. Uh, when I work in a project developers, uh, want to apply microservices concepts right away. I have decided to create services, but use the same database with different teams, uh, just not go all the way. The important part is to keep the main separation very clear. So okay. th there's no question. It's, that, that's it. it. it uh, it's an observation, but okay. I mean, I, I would like to comment on it is that you obviously have the right idea. So from my understanding, it's one system, but you design it in a way that is kind of modular in, in by nature. Okay, uh, is the MM a single process? Yes. Okay, next one. Uh, this is also not a question. Kindly mention some uh, example of monolith system design, but a bottleneck that will indicate that we should pay attention to develop microservices. So that's a great question. So essentially, it boils it down to <laughs> it boils down to when would you want to go from a monolith into microservices, and this is typically when you've hit the limits of your monolith, most, most likely your application performance is starting to suffer. For example, your reads are slowing down or your writes are taking forever. So you're usually going to see one part of your monolith system uh, give up before the other parts. And this is going to be the, the most used part in your system. So when you identify a situation like this, where one part of the system is under a heavy load, while other parts of the system are not as much, this is when you've encountered a bottleneck. It can be maybe in your web application or even in your database, but it's still, you're, you're going to be able to identify kind of what are the features or functionalities that are problematic. And then you want to migrate those into an individual service. Okay, next one. Um, a modular monolith is based on directories structure or a solution based on linked projects like layers. So you can use either approach. What we did is we kind of created top level folders for each module. And then inside of those module folders, you kind of place all of the projects comprising your individual module. And then your solution ends up being a set of top level folders, which represent the modules and then projects inside. But if you want, you can even keep it one physical project. I don't see why not. Although you're going to have a problem with references, which is why you may want to opt for kind of separate projects. Okay. How are the entities or tables that are transversal to all the databases or microservices handled? Where should they be created? Okay, so each module should have its own set of entities, which should be independent from the entities of the other modules. And then depending on the level of isolation that you want to apply at the database, these entities are going to be in different places. They can be in the same database, in different schemas, in different databases. You have a lot of freedom here. 
Okay, thank you. What are your, your thoughts on ABP framework for modular DB apps? So I haven't used the framework in practice, so I don't have an opinion, unfortunately. Okay. Can we create more than one database based on modular monolith like Redis or Mongo? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. With relation relation database at SQL Server, as SQL Server. Yeah, yeah. You 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 can definitely do that. Uh, typically, if you have a higher read load, you'll usually have one maybe let's say you started your system with the relational databases like SQL Server, then you add Redis to kind of support your reads. And then you may want to add even MongoDB into the system to support some unstructured data. So this is something that, that you can do. Okay. Uh, couldn't I use a strategy pattern to actually don't have a runtime coupling when doing meta calls? way we can change the behavior at runtime. Well, you, you still depend on the runtime implementation, regardless of the approach you're using to actually abstract away the method calls. Because when you think about it, the implementation of a public interface of one module is most likely going to also live inside of that module, even though it's hidden maybe behind uh, the inside of that project. And at runtime, your one module is dependent on an interface, but the interface is repl replaced with a concrete implementation if, you if you're familiar with dependency injection. So you're at, at runtime, you're going to get the implementation of that interface independent of what approach you're using to actually provide that implementation. So you, you, you kind of can't avoid coupling, at least runtime coupling, if you're using that approach. Okay, here's one, here's the long one. Oh, no. If modules in a modular monolith uh, communicate using APIs or messages, it means every module is an executable by itself, right? Also database or data module Coupling means we need to deploy all services at the same time when a module changes, uh, which introduces even more complexity in deployment that, than microservices. In this case, that what is the advantage of modular mon monoliths over microservices? So you, you have to realize that even though your modules are designed to be independent, they are not separate executables. They are all part of one executable, which is your entry point into your system. And even though you design your modules to kind of be able to run separately, even for example, if they communicate using a message bus, they are still part of one executable and they are deployed together. Obviously, as you mentioned, one problem is if there's a change to one module, but not the others, it affects the deployment of the entire application. So that's a downside. So if you need something like that, where you can have downtime of certain parts of the system, then maybe that's a sign that you do actually need a microservices environment. Now, the benefit of a modular monolith is that you can start designing your system in a modular way from the start, while not having to think about the additional complexities that microservices introduce, while at the same time having the capability to move into microservices with a lot, with easily move into microservices by extracting the individual modules. Okay. Regarding intermodule communication, when you need a synchronous call to another module for purpose of data, read that needs to be used in runtime. Does async message bus make sense then? So uh, yes, and this is the approach that that we used for for getting data from different modules at runtime. 
So we used uh, mass transit is the name of the library. And if you Google the mass transit request response model, you're going to find an interesting uh, implementation. It comes down to defining uh, two sets of interfaces. One is the request interface and one is the response interface. And your module that needs some data, it's going to send a request message. Then it doesn't know which module is going to handle that. That's the, ability, that's the responsibility of the other module that is listening to that message. And then that module knows how to handle that message and provide a response back. So that's one way you can do it. Uh, it's blocking for the module that requires the data, but it's asynchronous for the module that is providing the data. So something to consider. Next one, what kind of scaling approach is more applicable when in-memory calls is implemented? So I'm not sure exactly what the question is in terms of scaling, because if you have a modular monolith, it's still just one application. So the way you scale it is you either make that machine bigger, or if you want to improve the speed of your reads, you can introduce a cache between modules. Okay. You can talk, uh, you talk about not using foreign keys, but even when using different databases, you may need to reference something from a different module. Example, uh, an order references a product in the catalog and a, con uh, and a customer. How do you reference this without foreign keys? Well, it's very simple. You just use the ID from the original table without a physical foreign key, which imposes an actual connection at the database level. So you rely on the identity of that product or customer in their respective databases, and you use the ID of those records to identify them in the order. So you're kind of relying on those keys to be present while not relying on foreign keys to impose a physical connection in the database, which is actually something that is very typical in a microservice environment. In case of full data isolation and communication between modules using APIs or messages, why not go full microservices? Because you may not need to. So microservices means you have physical separate physical applications running at the same time. It also means you need to provision the infrastructure that is required and so on. Whereas with a modular monolith, yes, it's everything is kind of decoupled and nicely organized, but it's one executable. It can be even one database server with different databases running and then a message bus kind of as an independent component. So it's a, a lot less moving parts than with an actual microservice architecture. Okay. I'm building new super cool accounting and billing software. When I identify my modules, I found 10 modules. Is it good to go with modular mon monolith? So I kind of try to avoid giving generic advice when when I don't know too much about your system. So I, I, I would uh, I wouldn't I would skip this question. Okay. Uh, regarding defining module boundaries early, what if there are many unknowns? We know that we don't know how uh, we don't know everything ahead of time. Is it possible to do this uh, iter iterate? I'm not sure, iteratively with heavy refactoring as the system grows. What is your experience with that? Okay, so, so that's a real problem. So you may not know and you're not going to know everything ahead of time. So one thing you can do is ask a lot of questions. I know that's not very helpful, but you really want to find out as much information as possible. 
And another thing that you can do is, yes, modular monoliths are easy to kind of refactor and they're very flexible. So you can define your modules to the best of your knowledge when you start. Just consider the implications of that refactoring in terms of the data, because that's where you're going to have the most friction. So you should probably then consider either using the, you're probably going to want to use um, a single database with separation by schemas so that if you figure out that your module boundaries are wrong, you can just easily move tables between schemas and you're, going, you're not going to encounter too much trouble. Spend more time planning boundaries. Isn't that the same as not starting off with the microservices advice from Fowler? Yes, I would, I would say that it boils down to, to the same thing. Okay. If your databases are isolated from each other, what is in a good approach for acquiring data that resides in more than one database for populating into, say, a table layout as part of user search operation? So, so that's an interesting problem to, to consider. Um, if you do need data from from different databases, that should either be a signal that you have a system that is too granular. So you have data that is constantly queried together, but lives in different databases. So this is problematic because you're kind of, that should be a sign to you that maybe there should be one database or one system. So that's one consideration, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is you, you want to introduce some sort of component that is going to wrap those calls. Uh, maybe some sort of uh, gateway isn't really um, the term that I'm looking for, but it should explain kind of uh, maybe an aggregator would be a proper term where you have some component that is going to query the individual modules, kind of patch all of that data together and return it as one response. Okay. How did you consume messages, a worker process maybe? And one more question from the, the same guy. And how, to, uh, how would you cater versioning? So I'm not sure what, I'm going to answer the second questioning, second question first in terms of versioning. So you can, I'm, and I'm assuming the question is about API versioning. If not, then please feel free to post a second question. Um, you can version your API however you want to. You want to keep a high level separation between modules, and then you can decide if you want to version the entire API together or you may even want to consider versioning the individual modules uh, independently. So for example, all of your modules could be on version one and one module could be on, on version two. And if you could repeat the first question, I forgot. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, how did you consume messages? A worker process may uh, Yes, yes, I recall now. So yes, um, a worker process, I believe, is what we were using, honestly, mass transit. And, but I do think it uses a worker process in the background to consume messages on the service level. Or of course, if you were to implement it like on your own, you could either do a worker process or if you're using SP.NET, you have access to the hosted service uh, concept. What about the front end applications? Are there any considerations to take into account when choosing an architecture, monolith modular microservices? So I'm not really um, a front end guru and I'm not sure how good my advice is going to be, but I, I would say it's not really relevant how the backend is built as long as you expose a meaningful API to your front-end application. Okay. When many DB isolation level is implemented, 
isn't it add load to infra team by making difficult to sync data between fraud UAT test dev environments? Okay. So the problem is, okay, synchronization of data between environments. So I'm not sure why you would want to do that. I assume mostly mostly for, for testing purposes, but in any, in any case, you can always create backups and restore them accordingly when you need to copy some data over. How do you notice chatting modules implement some overarching logging or with the within the bus? So you're going to kind of see parts in your code that are consistently either sending messages that are intended for a single module to consume or are actually calling the public API of the other module to send some data. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I can come up with a, with a concrete kind of rule of thumb. Uh, th the best I can say is when you're working inside of a system that is designed as modular, it's really going to kind of come to your attention that you have two modules that are consistently talking together, being chatty. Okay, did you face any situation where you where you had to use two-phase commits or segas to deal with eventual cons consistency with the modular monolith? Uh, yes, yes, we ran into a problem like that where we designed the system to be eventually consistent, but on the UI side, we had to be immediately consistent. So we had to resort to using um, some sort of you can consider it a saga, uh, but it's really problematic for to implement because you need to take into consideration all of the possible things that can go wrong, definitely implement some sort of uh, retry mechanism or and also compensating actions so that you don't leave the system in an inconsistent state. So kind of avoid such implementation if you can, but if you have to do it, then really consider every possible edge case and make sure you have it covered. Isn't it better to design the, the base system to match the final design so that it doesn't change with the migration from a modular architecture to a microservice architecture? I'm not sure if it's better or not because when you are starting with a monolith, you are most likely starting with a limited set of data in terms of the information that you know that you're going to need, which is going to evolve over time. So it's going to come down to you making the best informed decision possible at that point in time. How do you choose what part of monolith should be excluded into microservices? So when you design the monolith to be modular. The individual modules are the parts that are kind of candidates to become a microservice. Okay, every module has its own front end or share the same front end. So how we did it was it was a shared front end. So a shared front end calling the the API. Uh, we actually had a gateway. Um, also implemented. Uh, so the API doesn't have to know what your backend architecture is. Why would someone use modular monoliths over microservices? Communication and data sharing seem too similar other than the shared physical database. So exactly. So the idea behind modular monoliths is you have the physical architecture of a monolith and the logical architecture of microservices. This comes hand in hand with communication and data isolation. And the main benefit is you simply don't need microservices to start with, especially if you know your system isn't going to scale that much, but you, you know that sometime in the future, maybe a few years down the line, if your business is doing very well, 
you may want to then move into microservices. So modular monoliths are kind of counting on that fact that in the future you want to migrate to microservices, but you don't want the complexity of microservices right from the start. Do you have other GitHub links uh, what we can look? So uh, I do believe we're going to send uh, a few resources uh, tomorrow along along with the recording. So I'll make mm -hmm. sure to to include some uh, some resources then. Okay, can you recommend the resources we can use to learn uh, how to design and develop uh, .NET apps using a modular monolith approach and also using SQLRS? So again, again, kind of the, the again, same yeah. answer that I gave to the previous question. Uh, and you can refer to the repository that I shared in, in my presentation. Uh, I do believe somebody also shared it in the chat. Okay, um, just to confirm, not using foreign key could be better for this approach, is the right? Yes. Okay, what is the best input to be used in microservice in your opinion? They're all good. I mean, unless you need something very, very specific, any any good message broker is going to get the job done. We used RabbitMQ. You could also use Azure Service Bus, uh, Kafka. So they're all kind of get the job done in terms of uh, the simple communication. Uh, have you ever encountered some bottlenecks with microservices? Uh, bottlenecks with microservices. So I can't really think of, of a good example. So I'll have to I'll have to pass on this one. Okay. I want to know how to create unique database for each module if we work with EF core. Okay, so you're going to have um, a separate database context for each module. And then that database context is going to be responsible for creating the separate database. Okay. Does using multiple databases introduces delays in data reading. In comparison, you have a single database for the whole system. For example, in cases where in order to retrieve the whole information needed, multiply uh, modules have to be exceeded. So I assume the question is if you have multiple databases and also the need to query more of them at a single time, which I believe we also addressed during a part of a previous question, um, you either should consider merging these databases together. So that could be one option. And another option would be using some sort of aggregated component, which is going to be responsible for, for querying from these databases. And let's do maybe one or two more questions. One, maybe we can go one more. There are some really long ones after the one that I'm going to read to you. So maybe you can answer them, you know, to, to type the answer or do you want to go? Mm -hmm. Like that, yeah? Okay. Uh, hi, how does module, modular monolith perform in regards to security? How secure is it? So I would say it's uh, very secure. So first off, let's say you're building an API, you can implement some sort of security mechanism. For example, we used uh, JSON web tokens, maybe you can use cookies. So that's one level of security. Then depending on the level of isolation that you use in the database, you can have more or less security. So if you're if you were using separate databases, your system would obviously be more secure because your data would be isolated. So that's that. Okay, then we are wrapping up, right? Thank you everyone for all the questions and thank you Milan for today's session and uh, for accepting our invitation.
And I would like to thank you everyone for being with us tonight. And for the end, I would like to invite you all to register on your local Jobberty platform and explore it. Let us know if you have any other questions, of course. So follow us on social media and stay up to date with our channels and new events. So wish you all a great evening and see you soon again. Thank you everyone for coming and I wish you all uh, a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye.